panelists, let me introduce them. We have, first off will be Chris Wright. He's with Liberty Oilfield Services. He is a self-avowed tech nerd science geek turned energy entrepreneur. And he credits his interest in fracking to a semester spent in Berkeley. Interesting. Um, he also is an avid climber and uh, learned how to do that in El Dorado Canyon. Next up will be Ivan Penn. He's an energy correspondent for New York Times out of LA. So he covers everything from renewable energy, power grids, storage, as well as the fossil fuel end of things. Um, an interesting fact about Ivan is that he and his wife founded a nonprofit that educates about social justice issues through art, song, theater. Um, and I said, oh, that's interesting. And it's like, well, the theme of storytelling runs through all of that for him as a correspondent and his nonprofit. And then third up, we have Steve Rubin. He is a Colorado native, a long-term photojournalist and documentary photographer who's turned professor. Um, he teaches uh, photography and related things at Penn State. His interesting fact, it's a little sad, he's, he notes that he's one of the few people that actually left Colorado. Um, <laughs> but he did it to become a globetrotter and how, can't blame him for that. So um, with that, we're gonna start, we're gonna go down the line and hear from each of them before we dive into questions. Chris. Thank you, Mayor. And thanks everyone for being here today and the interest in this topic. We're gonna try not to put you to sleep today. Energy matters a lot. Throughout all of human history, global life expectancy has been between 30 and 35 years. In the last 200 years, it's doubled. Also throughout all of human history, about 90% of the population lived in grinding poverty. In today's terms, less than $2 a day. That has dropped from 90% 200 years ago to 10% today and falling. I believe the two biggest catalysts for this tremendous advancement of humanity was the growth of human liberty, bottom-up organization economically and, and rights, and the arrival of fossil fuels, which just dramatically expanded the available energy. Um, unfortunately, we still have a billion people in the earth without access to electricity. Another billion or so with only intermittent access to electricity. We have two to three billion people on the planet that still cook the way our ancestors do, in sort of a deadly fashion of using wood or charcoal, burning it indoor in huts. The World Health Organization estimates three to four million people a year die from that indoor air pollution. So when I was in high school in Denver in the early 1980s, there was uh, a widespread belief, almost a panic, on depletion. We were running out of everything, oil, natural gas, fertilizer, farmland, tin, metals. A.A. A. Bartlett was a professor at CU, who was a big proponent of this. It quite impacted me as a kid. Stanford professor Paul Ehrlich, and I read a lot of his stuff, said the war against hunger is over and we lost. A hundred million Americans will starve by the year 2000, he confidently predicted. So as a kid, this was frightening to me. Um, and in fact, it impacted my decision of my future. I knew even, even in high school that energy was critical to the life we live today and to lifting people out of poverty. And in fact, I specifically went to MIT to work on fusion energy. We were running out of the energy sources we had. We need something else abundant uh, that could go there. I worked in solar energy in graduate school. I worked in geothermal energy for years after graduate school. I don't care where energy comes from. What matters is that it's abundant and affordable and enables humans to have wonderful lives. And most importantly for those people, less fortunate than us that are struggling. The US shale revolution, which in a blind squirrel finds nut story, I played a little role in the start of it in the, in the late 1990s, has just dramatically changed global energy markets. Uh, the price of oil has been halved, the price of natural gas has been cut in half due to surging US production. This is a little bit over a trillion dollars a year savings to the consumers of the world. Um, that's about $200 for every man, woman, and child on the planet. If you wealthy folks in Boulder, maybe no big deal, but for a lot of people, this is huge. This is game changing. Are there downsides? Of course. 
Nothing, nothing comes for free. If you live near development, the biggest impacts, and they are real, truck traffic, dust, noise, um, you're impacted by it. We've developed technologies to mitigate those impacts. That's one of the major things my company has done, and we've made major progress in all of them. But is the impact gonna be zero? Never, never. No human activity has a zero impact. When they built a Starbucks, when they built this gorgeous building we're in, it was, it was significant impacts. The, net, the nets were positive. In fact, I had a latte for breakfast today, but there's always impacts. Uh, concerns about groundwater have been huge over the last 10 years. Look, fracking is 70 years old. It would be collecting social security today. But the recent wrinkle that enabled the shale revolution is different, and it, and it led to this surging production, and therefore everything in the news. So one of the biggest things you hear about is groundwater concerns. What could be more dramatic than that, than polluting groundwater? Uh, that, would be awesome. that would be awful. Um, it's been exhaustively studied, including by the uh, Obama administration's uh, EPA for three years. I'm very glad they did that. Um, and the concerns there have been found to be unfounded. It does not impact the quality of groundwater. And mostly it's because what we do is two miles underground, and we're getting bubbles that have been underground for 100 million years. If they had a pathway to get up, they wouldn't be down there. Um, sorry about that. Uh, in Colorado, energy poverty, again, not in Boulder, energy poverty is still a major issue. In the San Luis Valley, poorest part of Colorado, 25% of low-income houses still heat their homes with wood. The, the health impacts that are just dramatic for what their children and for what will happen. Um, about 14% of Coloradans have gotten disconnection notices for their utilities. Um, this, this matters. The price and availability of energy, not just in poor countries, but everywhere matters dramatically. Um, everywhere and, and at any time, the price of energy in, is a dramatic influence on in the quality of human lives. The world needs more energy. Great. <laughs> All right, thank you, Chris. And now we'll turn to Ivan. Good morning, everyone. Um, as, uh, as mentioned, I'm Ivan Penn. I'm the energy correspondent for the New York Times who covers the power grid. And I'm going to just give a little background just to set some context for my other comments. Um, so uh, for the last 10 years, I've been covering utilities and, and energy. Uh, started covering these issues in Florida at the Tampa Bay Times. Um, and uh, prior to that, for the good part of almost two decades prior, um, I uh, covered government, politics, criminal justice, um, communities, and all of that becomes sort of relevant to where I'm sitting now, particularly because uh, I look at the energy issues through the lens of uh, all these other reporting experiences. Um, having covered uh, city halls, uh, state governments, uh, legislatures, governors, um, and members of Congress. Um, I've seen a lot of different players come to the table around energy and with a variety of arguments. Um, I'm, I'm not an opinion writer, I'm a news writer, so um, I just look at it from the standpoint of what's the information and try to educate the public about as much of what I've learned uh, and can share. And one of the things that I've seen over the course of uh, my time as a reporter and particularly covering energy is when you get to um, the debate, you know, should it be uh, nuclear, should it be uh, coal, should it be natural gas, solar, wind, biomass, uh, geothermal, uh, you get to the table all of these different players who uh, all have an interest. Um, there are those who have a product, obviously. Um, and then the debate ensues. And at the conclusion of it all, one of the things I guess I've seen is this, that um, you, at the end of the day, now have a variety of technologies to get the energy that we do need. And the question is, uh, which one is the one that you believe best serves you? 
And so how do we educate the public enough to be able to make uh, the, the best choice that they can? Uh, because in the, in the marketplace of ideas and in the energy market, each party is trying to make a case as to why their source is important. Um, in the case of, of uh, natural gas and, and fracking, uh, natural gas has been seen as the quote unquote bridge fuel to a quote unquote clean energy future. Because in particular, uh, solar and wind are what have been termed as intermittent. Um, the wind doesn't always blow, the sun doesn't always shine. So um, you need something in between. Storage, uh, say, too expensive. Uh, but what we saw with solar, when solar was considered too expensive, we saw double-digit uh, percentage decreases year over year, and we've begun to see that with, with storage as well. So, uh, and, and then there was the question of, well, they're not reliable enough to make the, gr the it'll disrupt the grid, and, uh, and then we'll have blackouts, because if you have, um, too much power coming onto the grid, uh, that can cause a blackout just like too little power can cause blackouts. Um, well, those things uh, have been dealt with. So now we're not talking about technology. Um, and, and Chris was talking about the fact that, you know, he, he supports all uh, types of energy, which is position of many people. But on a practical level, the question really remains, well, you can't, uh, everybody's not going to come away from this as a winner. And the real big question is, who pays and who gets paid? Thank you, Ivan. All right, Steve. Great. Uh, good morning, everyone. I I'm Stephen Rubin, and I'm an associate professor of art at Penn State University. And you may wonder, what is an art professor doing on this panel? Well, I might suggest that actually there's, there's real value for, for, for art and humanities on, on a panel like this. But also, my, my background really is as a, as a photojournalist and, and documentary photographer. And most recently, I've spent uh, essentially between 2012, 2017, working on a project called Shale Play, uh, which is uh, documenting some of, the, some of the impacts of fracking in, in Pennsylvania. So my, my focus is really, really Pennsylvania. I, 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 hope, I know that, of course, we're, we're here in Colorado, but I think there's a lot of things from Colorado, I'm sorry, from Pennsylvania that are very, very relevant to, to here. So the work that I've done is really spent by, by, by traveling through the state forests of, of Pennsylvania, of, of talking to farmers, talking to people working in the industry, talking to students who, who want to go into the industry, who get jobs in the industry, speaking with activists, speaking with people who've been positively affected by fracking, and people negatively impacted by, by fracking. Um, also, just, just to put Pennsylvania in some context, Pennsylvania is actually the, the second largest producer of of uh, natural gas in the, in, the, in the country. So we're just second only to Texas. So we, you know, we, we produce a lot of gas, and that's, that's had a, a huge impact on, on, on the state. So, um, so with a state producing that much gas, you might be puzzled or at least interested to, to learn that Pennsylvania does not charge a severance tax to, to oil and gas companies when they're, when they're extracting natural gas in, in the fracking process. In fact, I think we're the only state in the country that, that does not do that. So you might wonder why. Well, some of that can actually be traced to uh, a former Penn State professor who did a study in 2009 uh, projecting all of these massive, wonderful uh, benefits that would come from the development of, of natural gas within, within the state. Uh, what was, I mean, it was just kind of forecasting economic development, it was forecasting the number of jobs that would be created, and also the, the tax revenues that would, would come from that. And that report was so influential that it had the, the governor at the time, Governor Rendell, who had proposed there to be a severance tax, he actually withdrew that proposal. Um, and it was described, of course, as being that kind of tax has always been described by industry as being like a, a job killer, right? You've probably heard that term here, here in Colorado, right? Well, so we don't, we don't have a severance tax. And what's interesting to note is the, certainly the impact, the negative impact that has on the state in terms of the loss of potential revenue from, from all these oil and gas companies. But also, there's an interesting note that th this study, which was, which was funded by the, by the gas companies, it was not revealed 
that this was funded by the, by the gas company. So this is a real violation of academic integrity, and this is, this is where this term fracademia com comes from, is from, the, from this 2009 study by, by Tim Considine. So that's a little bit of the context of, of, of Pennsylvania. So provide you a little bit more information about, about my adopted state. Um, one of the things that we have done in Pennsylvania is to, um, the, the, uh, the brine that, that comes up from, from the extra extraction process, right? Um, we, in, in Pennsylvania, like Colorado, we get a lot of snow um, and a lot of ice on the roads. And so, you know, we, we ice the roads. And what's been used to, to ice the roads both during the winter but then also to keep dust down during the summer um, is radioactive brine, right? So this has been spread, spread on, on the roadways. Um, and this has been this has been done for this was done for a number of years until someone started, wanted to sue about it, and a Penn State professor actually did do a, a, some some uh, some investigation on this, and now it's been suspended. But I think this is kind of a, a cautionary note when we when we might suggest about the, the how how valuable kind of innovative entrepreneurship can can be in this, these kind of situations. I think there's real uh, like a real cautionary note. Is that a place like Pennsylvania, we, we have our own Department of Environmental Protection, but they are, they are woefully underfunded, right? It's very difficult for them to do their job. Um, in fact, they are, they're just repeatedly negligent about, about their job, partly from underfunding, partly from being understaffed, but also from just being, in, in many ways, in working close collaboration with, with industry. So my, my work, and I would sort of suggest to this panel, I think it's important that we, that we, we, we speak you know, at the, sort of the macro level and think about energy policy and those kind of directions, but I think it's also really important to get down to the micro level and talk about individuals who are, who are impacted by, by this, for, for better or, or worse. And that's a lot of where I've tried to, to focus my work. So um, I think that if, we're, if we're, we're talking about some of the, the benefits of fracking, and I've certainly, certainly seen some of those, I think it's a, you realize when you spend time with people, it, it is a complex story, right? I mean, there are, I've met a good number of farmers who've actually been able to save their farms because they've been able to sign leases, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's a reality. Uh, some of their neighbors have not been so, so pleased about that. Some of those farmers themselves have had misgivings about signing leases and having, having wells on, on their land that it's impacted their crops and it sometimes even impacted their, their, um, their, their water. But there, I think to claim that, that while the EPA may have made a kind of a statement about the water. If you, if you go into some of the, the, the rural roads of Pennsylvania and you talk to people, you talk to farmers, you, you, you find people whose, whose water has been contaminated, that their spring, that their cattle used to drink from for, for decades, the, the cattle just suddenly, after fracking started nearby, they stopped drinking from this, from this well. I mean, I've just found so many people who are in situations like that or who, who live next to, who live in a holler or just in the back roads. I'm, I mean, we're really talking, this is like southwest Pennsylvania. This is really, this is, is Appalachia. And people who, uh, who live next to a compressor station, a compressor station that was, was not permitted. They actually, was, they were given a permit five years after it was built. If, if, you, if you did a, an addition to your house without a permit, you know, they'd be in there in a minute. But this is something that I think some of the, the companies can, can get away with. But I think like operating on those kind of levels and seeing how people's health is in fact I impacted by this industry, I think it's really important to kind of drill down into the individual stories that might be dismissed as being anecdotal but are still very, very real and important, I think, need, need, to, be, need to be heard. So, thank you. Thank you. Okay, just a reminder, uh, keep the questions coming. I'm gonna try to um, sift through and lump because we're getting themes showing up. Holler if you need a note card. Do, Do you mind passing out the card? Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, just raise your hand. Okay, we've got a couple of hands right here. Um, I'm gonna let the panel, if any of you wanna respond to what you've heard from the others and then I'm gonna start firing questions. Does anybody, was anybody provoked by someone in a useful way? <laughs> Well, I thought good, good, thoughtful opening remarks from both of my fellow panelists. And, and Stephen, you point out some of the things been done wrong in Pennsylvania. I agree 100%. A lot of, a lot of st stupid things were done there by the government, by companies, by whatever. Um, yeah, Wh whoever thought of using deep from underground salt water to, to use the salt from that on the roads, crazy idea. Fortunately, we don't do that in Colorado. In fact, I've never heard of it done elsewhere, but I'm sure it has. Um, also, but, Ohio, uh, Ohio has done it as well. So, I'm interested in, um, 
you're mentioning, Chris, um, the, the benefits that have come from fossil fuels in terms of life expectancy. And so it's, I think, you know, clearly that's, that's contributed a lot to, to, to development and certain, certain measures of, of progress. But I, I guess my concern is that as important as, as oil, fossil fuels have been in terms of life expectancy, I think it's overlooking a number of like kind of key pieces like I think something, some of it has to, the increase of the doubling of, of human life expectancy actually really has, has to do with people discovering things like germ theory, insulin, better water. Uh, I mean, there's, I mean, if you were to speak with public, uh, public health folks, I think they would have a long list of things that have contributed to the expansion of, of human life expectancy. Moreover, if I can kind of challenge you more, if, if you see that um, life expectancy has gone up, while fossil fuel development has also gone up, right? So, but, but as, as, and as now that this country is the number one producer of oil and natural gas, right? Um, so if we've got up even higher, more recently, actually human life expectancy is already, in, in this country has actually started to take a, a slight <coughs> decline. So if it were a simple matter of fossil fuels in, increases uh, human life expectancy, expectancy, why is with this sudden kind of surge in fossil fuels do we see life expectancy actually going, going down in just within the past year or two? So g g great, great comment, Stephen. And, and I, I would agree 100%. The proximate cause of this huge increase in life expectancy has been public health measures, clean water, germ theory, um, a huge number of proximate causes. But the question is, why did all those things happen recently? You know, uh, um, Hippocrates, Galen, and Leonardo da Vinci focused a fair amount of their effort on human health and how can we understand how the body works and all that, but we didn't get any health advancements from that, right? We only got, re and I'm type one diabetic. I, I often say I would not have celebrated my 14th birthday party if not for oil and gas and the growth of human liberty. Because this was a death sentence throughout all of human history till the early 1920s. But we'd started to have modern medicine. People could travel, we had universities, conferences, scientific testing, making drugs, doing these things. Plastics that are key to medical things are made out of oil. So I think it's the growth in wealth that the growth in human liberty and fossil fuels have allowed, this, have, allowed have been the ultimate cause of all these proximate things that have grown life expectancy. If you plot, and I do, life expectancy versus per capita energy consumption across the world, it's a pretty amazing correlation. Uh, Japan consumes 100 times more energy than Niger, and they live 35 years longer. So yes, we've had huge progress from all the things you mentioned, but why? Why didn't we have that 500 years ago or 1,000 years ago? Well, if I could um, just challenge you on one, one area. I mean, uh, in your opening comments, and to sort of ride on, on Steve's coattails here, um, the, the fact that energy uh, obviously is critical to us, one thing we learned uh, with the economic crisis was we peaked in our energy, our, our electricity consumption. Um, but with the economic crisis, we saw consumption across the country fall and go flat, and in large part due to what has been termed the low-hanging fruit of energy efficiency. Um, one of the questions that I have tried to pose to, to all the players is, um, do we need to build anything? Um, do we need to build even, uh, and, you know, obviously at some point we got to build something, but do we need to build a wind farm or a solar panel, more or less a nat gas plant, um, or, or other fossil fuel source before we've evaluated how we can continue to improve um, appliances, making things more efficient uh, so that we reduce our consumption because then in the end, one of the things that we're seeing is a massive export of natural gas, um, increasing growth in uh, liquid natural gas export facilities around the country. So we're not talking about providing energy for, for the local person, for Americans. We're talking about supplying fossil fuels to other places in the, in the world. Yeah, good, great, g g Ivan. So yeah, efficiency have been tremendous improvements. Since, since 1970, the US economy has more than tripled. Our energy consumption's grown about 
So that's more bang for the buck. That's technology and development, which is, which is fantastic. Um, well, we have had a change in the, in the energy mix, and I think we'll continue to have a change. So natural gas, for example, was a bit player in electricity 20 years ago. Today, it's the number one source of electricity in the United States. It's helped drive this continued cleaning of the United States air that we've seen dramatic improvement, 75% drop since 1970 in the EPA's top six named uh, criteria pollutants in the Clean Air Act. Um, and, and part of that is going to cleaner, so cleaner ways to produce electricity. But you're right, are we gonna see huge growth in energy consumption in the United States? No, I don't think we will. In fact, in most of the developed world, US CO2 emissions on a per capita basis peaked around 1960. They've declined for over 50, they, they continued to rise. Shell revolution has made them drop to over a 50 year low right now. So yeah, the, the, when I say more energy, it's not that we need it in the US so much, it's the rest of the world. It's the people that don't live like us that wanna live like us. Okay, I'm gonna, oh, there's lots of threads to follow. I'm gonna pick one of them because we're getting a bunch of questions about public health impacts. So you've been talking big picture trends and stuff. Let's bring it down to the people that live next door to stuff. So we have people in the audience that live in Erie next to major new plan developments, some underway, some um, coming down the pike. We have people asking about epidemiological studies regarding the direct health impacts from fracking, both um, I think a lot around air pollution um, and both toxics, to the toxic gases, the volatile organic uh, compounds, the benzenes, um, and also I'm gonna f weave into that the question that Ivan posed about who pays and who gets paid, and shouldn't those that are making money have to address the direct impacts that people next to this development are experiencing? Okay, so that's like 10 questions I got. <laughs> <laughs> who wants to go first? You wanna go first? I mean, yeah. I'll okay. go, but, but kick me out if somebody else should go right. first. Um, yeah, as, as, as you said, are there impacts from development? Absolutely. And fortunately, with better monitoring technology, we can quantify those things and have continued to do that. Volatile organic compounds is one that certainly comes from hydrocarbons. Um, Weld County's oil production has grown fourfold in the last eight years, and the VOC emissions, volatile organic compound emissions from oil and gas production have dropped 50%. That's just better technology. They haven't dropped to zero, but they've dropped a fair amount. The largest source of VOCs in, in Colorado is still natural, naturally occurring phenomenon. Second biggest is automobiles, trucks, again, burning fossil fuels. So they're real, but I think trending the right direction. In Weld County, first I'll talk macro and then we can get back into micro. Since this shale revolution really hit Weld County the last decade, a lot of the concerns, and I get the concerns, I, I'd be concerned too, what the hell's going on, what are the impacts? But cancer rates, respiratory disease rates, uh, respiratory rates and heart, and, and heart disease that things often pointed for have all declined meaningfully during the last decade as weld oil production has surged. Not true. Okay, whoa, whoa, whoa. Look whoa, whoa. at the Colorado Department of Public Health data. Thanks for that, but we're gonna move to the other panelists. Um, well, in, uh, okay, another, another um, situation in, in, in Pennsylvania. So uh, a few years back, um, there was a, a, a pipeline exploded uh, killed killed a, a gas worker. Um, this was it, was it was a Chevron location, and what Chevron did was they, they passed around uh, pizza to the community. Actually, they gave around f right, free, free vouchers to the to the community. So, um, but there are in, in terms of other impacts. Certainly, there are um, increasing the number of epidemiological studies that are looking at um, how those people who are living near uh, fracking sites, um, that the, more and more babies are being um, born premature, that increased, increased rates of, of, of miscarriages as, as well. And I do think also we would, we would know more if, if many of the, the companies, and this is, I mean really when I, when I began this work, I, I really did not enter into it with a, with, with a bias, I did not enter it with a strong position, it was more an, an exploration, it was just really starting, driving the roads, backcountry roads, talking to people working in the industry, 
at least those who would talk to me, because many people who work in the industry won't talk to uh, any member of, of, of the media or anybody with a camera, but trying to get a sense of what's, what's behind this and why, you know, why do people go into this, into this work and what kind of opportunity does it offer people? Like in Pennsylvania, except for some of the major urban areas, we are, we're a state that's losing population. Unlike, unlike a place like Colorado, we're, we're, we're losing people, right? It's, it's a Rust Belt state. So what kind of opportunity does this provide these, these kind of people? But I think we would know more um, if, if oil and gas companies did, did not make people sign non-disclosure agreements, right? Which is something that's very, very common in the industry. So uh, and that, that conceals a lot of information in terms of what happens to people's water or, or, or health. Uh, there's a very famous case in Pennsylvania uh, called the, the Hallowich case, it's the Hallowich family. Uh, this was actually got a fair amount of press, it was published even in the National Geographic of a, a family that was very negatively impacted by fracking on, on their land. It was like a, a split estate situation where they didn't, they didn't own the, the mineral rights to their, to their land. And uh, you know their children became very ill. They reached an agreement with uh, the, the gas company, um, and, and the part of that agreement, you know, they bought they, their land was bought from them, their house was bought from them. They were able to, to move away, but part of that agreement, of course, w included a non-disclosure agreement, which essentially said they, they couldn't talk about it. Not just that, that the parents couldn't talk about it, but their children, age seven and ten, could not ever speak about it. And they gave them like a list of words that they could never, these children could never pronounce, right? So, or never, never say, even on the playground or something like that. So, so I think, I think if, if, um, if, if this industry, and again, I didn't come into this with a strong opinion on it, but it's really more, it comes out of just speaking with people and spending time on the ground. But if this industry really was as, as clean um, as, it, as it claims, Right? I think they wouldn't be doing all these non-disclosure agreements, and I think that they'd be more inclined to let the, the truth come, come out. So. Okay, okay, okay. Ivan, did you have anything to jump in with? Uh, well, so, so a couple of things. Um, one on the, the, the cleaner air piece. Um, so, yes, it's, it pollutes less than coal. Um, but uh, B Bill Gates uh, made the comment, the goal is not to take a bow because we use natural gas, you use natural gas, as he put it. Um, because the reality is that you're still, you still have a polluter. Um, and then in addition to the, the actual uh, issues re specifically dir directly related to natural gas, you have the chemicals that are injected when it goes through the process um, of powering plants and coming into your homes. And, and of course, in addition to explosions, which uh, uh, in California, um, which we saw uh, in San Bruno, um, and then the, the gas leak at the Aliso Canyon uh, storage facility, uh, there are challenges. Um, and and the, in a, the case of Aliso Canyon, they're still trying to grapple with the, uh, what they believe are the health effects from that leak, and whether it's the chemical that was injected or um, all of the other factors that, that, that come into question there. And, I, and I'm wondering what some of your thoughts are, especially in the context of, uh, of those leaks and the impacts. Uh, it was also in Alabama, Alabama, Eight Mile, Alabama, where there was a leak of the chemical that was injected that had an effect on an entire disadvantaged community. Um, how do we deal with all of these kinds of things that are direct impacts as well as uh, indirect impacts of, of uh, use of natural gas? And, and can I add to that question? Because um, we're getting some more on, do we have the right regulations in place? There was just a story a couple days ago um, related to, turns out in Colorado there's a loophole that new wells can uh, pollute for 90 days while they figure out how much they're gonna pollute and then the permit goes into place. So there's that somebody wants to know about. Uh, the EPA, uh, re this administration pulling back on EPA re uh, regulations related to certain air pollutions, air pollutants, and also uh, kind of that issue of um, how do we monitor, given that um, methane is a very potent greenhouse gas, we know that if if we, if we have s certain amount of leaks from pipelines and wells, it becomes pretty darn close to burning coal. Um, okay, so that suite of questions around monitoring, do we have the right regulations in place, and frankly, are they being enforced because <laughs> related to the questions that Ivan's teeing up. So play on that. Great, I'll, I'll try to take all okay. three of them uh, <laughs> quickly. You may have to help, help me remember. 
So, so Stephen talks about these non-disclosure agreements and all that. And yes, have people done bad things and there's lawsuits and people settle and they say non-disclosure? Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's unfortunate. Are there bad actors in our industry as in every industry? Of course, of course. Um, I, I employ, I started a company eight years ago here in Colorado, I employ 2,500 people. No one has ever signed a non-disclosure agreement in any business I've ever started. I've started four energy companies. In fact, I've never heard of anyone signing a non-disclosure agreement in any energy companies. So I think these are related to lawsuits. Um, in fact, but our industry done a lot of stupid things, which is they resisted the full disclosure of what we pump underground in these frack chemicals. I think that was insane. Fortunately, that went into law 2010, nine years ago, but it should have been 30 years ago. It should have been the moment anyone asked. Um, fortunately, right now, every well, all the chemicals that are pumped is put on a frack focus website. Um, we can buy every chemical in our frack fluids at Whole Foods. In fact, I did a little video making our frack fluids at a Whole Foods. Everything we use, we can buy at Whole Foods. We buy it cheaper in bulk, it's expensive at Whole Foods, but it's the same stuff. Um, uh, I, uh, Ivan talked about uh, this, there was a natural gas storage field in California de designed shallow. Na California has wildly too little natural gas storage. They have a poorly designed natural gas storage field um, that was over injected into and it leaked. Stupid mistake, a uh, bunch of methane leaked into the atmosphere, absolutely safety hazard, real things. The best answers to those things is the common law. If you harm people, destroy their property or whatever, you should pay for that. You're responsible for that. Um, was a comment about the regulations, and uh, our mayor, and I'll come back, our, 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 the mayor mentioned, which I think is also a very relevant point. Uh, if 8% of the methane leaks before it's burnt into a natural gas power plant, it becomes larger greenhouse gas effect than coal. So how much of the natural gas actually gets combusted versus how much gets leaked is massively important. The Sierra Club uh, partnered with uh, University of Texas to monitor at like eight different locations to try to measure leak rates. Um, they measured between a half and 1%. They didn't measure the whole process. The real leak rate, total leak rate is probably a little more than 1%, uh, which means the net reduction in greenhouse gases for the same amount of energy for natural gas versus coal is about 50%. It's not zero, but it's about half as much. There are growing and better technologies, some satellite based, some airplane based, some ground based to quantify leaks of natural gas and CO2. This is fantastic. We're getting quantification and measurements. Of course, we sell natural gas, so nobody wants to leak. It's just figuring out better technologies about how to reduce that small. Um, I could keep going on, but I'll stop. Well, why don't we let some other people jump in, and then you guys, you can jump back in. Well, so this idea of, of, of trade-offs and, and impacts, yes, okay, every, every energy source, production of any energy will, will cre create some, some negative impacts. So, and I understand uh, even something like, like wind. Uh, to build a wind, a wind farm, I mean, to create cl clean energy, you, s you use dirty energy to create clean energy, right? I've, I've spent a lot of time working in Kansas and some of the neighboring states, including eastern Colorado, photographing the, the rise of, of wind power and, 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 and watched as wind farms have been built. And there's, you know, there's a lot of steel involved, and of course, there's all sorts of kind of production of, of pollutions to create green energy. But once it's, once it's produced, for the most part, it's, it's, it's really quite, quite clean. But I, I think also in terms of when we, when we think about this idea of, of affordable energy and, and, the, and, the, and the term that's often used in terms of like that the natural gas is, 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 is cheap, I think it's important to also think about those kind of like what, what is not being um, considered in that, in that equation. So there's, there's even, it goes back a few years, there's a 2012 Harvard study that found that back in 2012, um, even the time of you know, really the, the fracking, fracking boom, that we're seeing that ever, uh, Americans were paying $500 billion a year for health-related costs related to the, the, the burning of, of fossil fuels, right? So, so these are costs that are externalized, right? So we might be getting cheap, cheap energy, but like ultimately, again, I think to, to Ivan's point, who is, who is paying or who, who suffers the consequences? And I think that's a lot of where my experience in Pennsylvania relates to this, that it is, we use this term uh, kind of, 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 of trade-offs or that there are, there are some, some always impacts, but really it's, it's, it's about a sacrifice zone, right? And, that, and Pennsylvanians, rural Pennsylvanians have, have seen this time and time again. They've seen it in terms of, the ex we have a long history of extraction. 
in terms of from, from timber, from, from coal, from, from coke, right, from oil, and, this, and, and fracking is just is like the latest, latest generation of this. And so it's, you know, people are, people are tired. People are, you know, they've been, they've been through these boom and bust cycles many times and people try to kind of catch the wave while it's riding high, but ultimately it seems to leave a lot of people sort of on, on, on the downside. So I think this is also really important to, to consider. Well, on the economic side of things, uh, I mean, what we're seeing now is uh, solar and wind are coming in cheaper in terms of electricity generation than, than even natural gas. Um, and the price of energy storage, uh, especially if you combine solar and storage together, are starting to beat out um, natural gas plants and even some natural gas peaker plants, which are sort of the critical pieces. So um, you're, you're seeing uh, some major shifts in that regard, but at the same time, um, and, and, and even when it was mentioned about a trillion dollars in savings because of shale, but in reality, one of the things that we're seeing in our electric bills all across the country is that rates are, have not gone down. Rates have actually gone up. Um, people are paying more for their electricity, uh, even as we're getting a diversity of energy sources. And every time someone puts a solar panel on their rooftop um, or a, and or a battery in their garage, uh, then they're getting hit with some kind of fee to make it difficult to, to realize any savings because the utilities are trying to preserve their economics. Um, and then when you start talking about sources of generation, well, a utility company would rather have a natural gas plant or build a natural gas plant because you have uh, the rate of return that they're going to get off the capital project is higher than a solar panel. And then you have more jobs um, on, a, on a continual basis working at a natural gas plant versus uh, the guy with the squeegee um, cleaning off a solar panel. Um, and, and so then you get the unions playing in, and it plays to the who gets, who gets paid and who pays. You have all of these different forces that have uh, almost nothing to do with the, the, the health impacts um, or what the source generation is itself, as much as it has to do with, um, you know, well, the unions want to make sure that they preserve jobs, um, especially high-paying jobs um, that are related to uh, uh, natural gas plants, coal plants, and ideally nuclear plants, because those are even higher pay or jo paying jobs, and uh, usually 600 jobs um, at a nuclear plant. So they want to push things that, that economically are difficult to achieve, even though, uh, like a nuclear plant, once you build it, um, yeah, the, the electrons that are generated are clean, but what do you do with the spent fuel rods? What do you do with all of these different components? Which always brings me back to the question, do you need to build anything? What, where can you find ways to reduce the consumption? Um, and then the very American thing of, you know, uh, how much can we allow people in a technological age that allows people to put a panel on their roof, a battery in their garage, um, that, that benefits uh, th that, that individual. So you teed it up nicely. There's a whole suite of uh, questions around. We've kind of covered public health, although we could spend several days on that. Let's talk climate change and what, there's a lot of questions, including from students, about what is responsible energy policy looking ahead? Not is something a little better than uh, something else, but what is responsible energy policy? What does it look like? How do we get there? Um, you, not just how does it affect our pocketbooks, but what is good policy? Um, somebody notes that Germany really <coughs> focused on renewable energies in a huge way. What are the impacts of that? Is that a model? Um, but anyhow, talk about climate and our responsibilities to the planet, not just the human race, but the human race and everything else on this planet generations from now. Okay. A a absolutely. I'll start and we'll, we'll keep mixing it up. So there was, a, there was a question from the audience about Germany versus the U.S. And we have indeed followed di very different paths. So Germany, it, it's, it's hard to get their actual number. They estimate it somewhere from 300 to 450 billion dollars they have spent over the last 15 to 20 years for, it's a German word I can't pronounce, Eiger Wendy, um, their energy transition. This started in 2000, renamed in 2010. 
So Germany spent a massive amount of money, and let's compare like the results. The economics, as we're hearing here, of utility power are very complicated. So Germany, Germany, electricity prices right now, retail electricity prices, 33 cents a kilowatt hour, uh, 11 cents in the United States. They have three times more expensive electricity in the United States, and they've reduced their CO2 emissions over the last decade less than the United States has. And further, from their own public health uh, studies, they estimate somewhere between 20 and 40,000 people freeze to death in Germany every year. These are low-income elderly people that can't afford to heat their houses to, to, uh, to safe temperatures. And so, again, the cost has a massive impact. So the renewables, and again, look, I, I worked in solar energy. I worked in geothermal energy. I'm all for cool new energy technologies. But the track record to date has just been disastrous, disastrous. Yeah, Germany gets today, after all that investment, 84% of its total energy from fossil fuels. U.S. gets 81% of our energy from fossil fuels. Same story in California. California invested a huge amount of money. They have 50% more expensive electricity rates, electricity rates than the country as a whole, 80% for industrial power. Um, relatively modest changes in, in uh, total net CO2 emissions. They basically just exported the jobs and they import the products. Um, and the worst thing I think in, in California, I lived there for 19 years, California has the highest adjusted poverty rate, this is US Census Bureau data, of any state in the nation. So when you make energy expensive, you not only hit poor people and paying for it, but blue collar jobs tend to be energy intensive. They export those jobs. So the so human toll has been dramatic. Solution? Uh, so what's sound energy policy given our climate imperative? Make, I want to make sure that gets, you can, we'll, we'll circle back, but make sure. Sure. Okay, right. not just what is bad, but what is good. Okay. Great. Well, uh, the, the, the policy picture, because it, 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 it really honestly ties to the question of who pays and gets paid. Because the problem is when you start talking about policy, when you go to the, the city halls, to the, to the state legislatures, it's not a question of which source that you, that you use. The question is all of these different players coming to the table and arguing their case as to why they, we should use this particular type of, of generation. Because when it comes to how, um, the, the, where, where you get the source from, how much is available, how it gets distributed, they're, they're all policy issues. Because we're not, we're not, because uh, uh, even in the case of um, where, where, where Chris mentions about uh, California and the rates and, and, and all of those things. So when you look at how it actually plays out, there's enormous amount of capacity on the existing system everywhere in the country. The, there, there are requirements, there are mandates about having reserve margins, but those reserve margins are largely determined by the energy industry. And in many cases, those reserves during the winter in some states is as high as 50%, and during the summer, 20, 30, 35% of reserves. And there are reserves on the transmission lines. That there's capacity that's going unused. There's there are there's capacity in the gas pipelines that that's not getting used. The policy question is. Can you get the public to understand enough to get, their, uh, to get their representatives to react to the fact that there already is a lot of stuff that's there that's not being used? And then you, you end up with the argument from all of these different players who are really trying to sell their products, quite honestly. Um, and so, so the policy-wise, it's more of an understanding of what you have what, what you can uh, do without, rather than just the argument that, because it is complex, for, that, that's, that's a true statement, but it's not as complex as, as it's made out to be. We, it's who gets paid and who pays, because the sources of generation are available. Yeah, I, I don't think I have an answer to the, to the policy question, but I, when I think about uh, natural gas and, and how it's described as being a, a bridge fuel, uh, a, a bridge to get us from dirty coal to, to clean renewables, uh, I guess my, my concern is that what, what that bridge really looks like um, and where it goes. 
And if, it's, if it really is a, a bridge to get us there, or if it's a bridge to nowhere, or a bridge to oblivion, or possibly even a, a gangplank, uh, because I think, um, I think in, in, in Pennsylvania and, and across the Northeast, uh, right now we're, we're building a lot of pipelines, right? It's, you know, there's a lot of protests against them, there's a lot of opposition, some of the constructions are being stopped because of all sorts of kind of environmental damages, but there's, you know, the, the, the companies, the investors are very determined, and these, you know, when you, when you're in, if you're an investor and you're building a pipeline, you're not interested in just a pipeline for a year or two or five years or something like this is this is long term and I think this this infrastructure is really locking us into this this energy source for for the long term and I think that's my concern and 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 and, and, and each of the generation sources and Chris mentioned this as well look I mean they're they're all they all have their issues um, now offshore wind is uh, being given serious consideration all around the country um, on the East Coast, West Coast, um, uh, in, in the Great Lakes. So it, it, one of the issues for California was that the water was too deep for a traditional offshore wind. So now they're talking about floating solar arrays, and then you have the wires going underground back to the shore, what happens to the whale migration? Um, so, I mean, you, everywhere you turn, there's an issue. There's, uh, on storage, um, an alternative to lithium ion is um, zinc air. Um, this is zinc. We all need zinc to live. Um, so the health uh, effects of zinc would be more positive. But you still got to mine the stuff. Um, there, there's issues all around with every type of technology. Which one is going to be the, the, mo the most uh, beneficial in terms of health and economics? That's the, those are the policy questions that, that have to be answered. And I, and I still, because this is, to me, always the biggest question do you need to build anything? Well, I'd say health, you know, certainly those big questions of health and economics, but also the, the 800 pound gorilla in the room called climate change, right? So. The climate's a big deal. So that's why we, uh, the questions are around the future. Um, the other bunch of questions have to do with, right now the oil and gas industry is considered one of the most powerful, the most powerful industry in the world, and seems to be dictating energy policy for the world, and we're ending up with climate change. So, okay, um, and the questions are, shouldn't they be paying more? Um, isn't our problem that capitalism profits are being put before these larger policy questions? Why do we have the lowest severance in the country? Um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Why do we have the lowest severance in the country? Again, because the oil and gas industry isn't paying for the impacts. So there is a suite of questions around, and well, Ivan keeps saying it, who pays and who gets paid? Those who are getting paid right now, um, there's a lot of questions about shouldn't they be paying more for the transition to a more sustainable future? Um, and why aren't they investing in the research to get us there nearly enough? Okay, suite of issues that keeps coming back to who should be paying um, for a more sustainable energy policy. Right, so I heard the comment, we're the most powerful industry in the world and we're forming policy and that's why we're using fossil fuels. I mean, nothing could be further from the truth. Look at the, look at the, 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 the oil and gas industry is widely hated. We've had enormous amount of laws. And I don't, I, look, I don't need to defend my industry or any other industry. What matters is not defending industries, it's about lifting human beings up. And the impacts of climate change um, and the trade-offs there, there's actually extensive economic analysis going on about it, as there should be. Everything is a trade-off. I think all three of us have said that. Nothing has no impacts. This name, clean energy, is a total misnomer. We all have different impacts in different ways. Um, I could go on about that. In, in, in the United Kingdom, it's impossible. There will never be another wind farm on land permitted. Because of the human impacts, they don't want them anymore. They're all over the place. You can't drive around without seeing them. So all their new de wind development is offshore. I did the simple math when I testified in their House of Lords. 200 acres in Pennsylvania produces more energy than the entire British wind industry. So the problem is energy density. Is, is, you know, is wind going to be a long-run solution for climate change or powering the world? The mass is almost certainly not. 
Solar, I think, is better and certainly has remote applications and things to go. I'm a huge fan of nuclear. Nuclear, I think, will see a renaissance. It's got political opposition now. For energy density, for dispatchability, reliability, minimum impact, it wins hands down. Um, fusion energy, what powers the stars and almost all the energy in the universe, very hard problem. That'll be solved, likely within a generation. Um, that's another enormous, awesome energy source with a very small footprint. So to me, who pays? Who pays right now are consumers, and particularly low-income ones, when misdirected policies make energy massively expensive. That, to me, is by far the biggest impact of climate change so far. So if, if you don't, if you guys, if you read the, the, what politicians say or the media says, you get one thing. If you actually read the IPCC reports and the economic studies, it's actually not that controversial that the net economic effect of climate change today is a positive. The, the planet has gotten 14% greener, higher agricultural productivity, more forests, grasslands, particularly in poor countries. It, by the IPCC, their last report, it's a 0.5% GDP negative economic impact at two degrees centigrade warming. We're at 0.9 right now. So a doubling of the warming shows a half a percent gross domestic product loss. That's somewhere late this century. So there are trade-offs, there are impacts, it is real. But what you hear in media and politicians is not based on the actual numbers of the science and the reports, it's based on sort of political agendas. Not to say it's not a real issue, it's a very real issue. But today the damage is dramatically worse from sort of feel good, not look at numbers responses to climate change than the actual impacts of it. Economics. Mm -hmm. Economics. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, Other thoughts? But, but depending, on, depending on how you parse those numbers, so in the, in the case of, of nuclear, um, the, the, the challenge, so we were supposed to have a nuclear renaissance um, that was supposed to produce 21 or so uh, new nuclear reactors in the United States. Um, that has now been reduced to, to two. Um, the, the Vogel plant in, uh, in Georgia, um, which needed uh, uh, federal loan guarantees to um, uh, still possibly reach the finish line. It's uh, of all of those 21, uh, these two units are the only ones that uh, have the potential of reaching the finish line. The problem is the economics. Um, it was supposed to be uh, four or five billion dollars a unit. Um, Vogel's now in, uh, in the neighborhood of 24 billion dollars. Um, in China, where they are bringing on new nuclear plants, um, the difference is you have a country that is building plants as opposed to a utility. Um, the universe of, of people who, can, uh, who are paying for that plant is not uh, the state of Georgia. It's not the state of, uh, of any individual state, and it's not the United States of America. It is one utility's customers. So when you start talking about the, uh, the ability to deliver a plant at that cost, your rates are going to go through the roof. Does a nuclear plant, once it is online, produce tons of clean, quote unquote, electrons? Yes, but then you also have the economics of what do you do with the spent fuel rods? And I mean, this also goes to the question of any of these sources. So if you do storage, what is America's plan for all of these batteries when it comes time to decommission all the batteries? What, what's the plan to do with all of this stuff, no matter what the source is? Um, and uh, because we, we, we come up with ideas and we don't think about these long-term impacts and then we're scrambling once again and, and we're beating up on each other because, well, well, they came up with this thing and now it's polluting our whatever. Um, but the question is, when are, when are we going to think about what the potential impact of whatever source it is before we start deploying? Mm -hmm. Did you want to jump I'm in? I'm fine. Go ahead. Oh, you're fine? Yeah. Um, just a couple things, because um, we're running out of time. So quick answers. Some people want to counter 
what you're saying about the IPCC report, noting that it also calls for ending fossil fuel extraction um, in 10 years, this question says, another one mentions extreme weather events. I, I will just add, you said about that so far we've seen a net benefit. I'll just note from the municipal government perspective, we can't afford the extreme weather events we're already seeing. Um, the flyers and the floods are killing us. And this is, you know, so anyhow. I, I, Can I jump into that? Yep. Yeah, so e extreme weather events is another thing. It's a media and politician thing. The IPCC has low confidence, has low confidence in, there's been no increase in floods, droughts, tornadoes um, in, in the data set. In fact, Roger Pilkey Jr., a professor at CU, has testified in this in Congress, written multiple times on it. Again, it's not controversial. They took it out of the IPCC reports. This is media or whatever. You look at the entire snowpack data in Colorado from 1937, no trend. You look at snow data from the northern hemisphere over the full data set, no trend. Up one year, down other years. The planet is warmed, but a warmer planet also means a wetter planet. So we've had a little bit of warming, and it brings more rain and more snow. So the, this, I think the extreme weather thing is the most misunderstood thing about climate change. Just Google it. You can, you can download all of the hurricane data, okay. 120 years. Same thing for floods, droughts, tornadoes, all this stuff. What you hear is simply not consistent with the data. But, but in the case of wildfires, so... They peaked in 1930. But, mm -hmm. but, but in the case of wildfires, so in California, we had, of course, uh, Pacific Gas and Electric, um, Paradise, the town of Paradise totally wiped out, 85 people uh, were killed. And what we saw in that case was that it was the utility and its tra transmission tower um, that was pointed to as the source of the wildfire and the lack of maintenance. And so if you, if you start look and, and then exacerbated by um, the, the impacts of climate change, uh, the worst wildfire in California history. Um, and then we want to look at uh, m using more fossil fuel plants and expanding the grid and more transmission through forested areas. Um, then the question becomes, well, if they are, are they going to be maintained when you have the option of a microgrid, um, a solar panel, and a battery versus sending transmission lines through mountains, um, and especially at Colorado, um, through a mountain that may be snow covered, um, that where you aren't able to consistently maintain. Uh, how, why are we not looking at um, possibilities that are more microgrids rather than uh, continually growing centralized power? I would just say that I, I, I'm not aware of, of um, I've, I've not read the IPC, IPCC report, but it's certainly now on my list of, of things to read. But I would just say that in, in, in general, uh, there are, there's more than one study, and there's certainly different interpretations of, of, of data that are, that are out there. Yeah. So I'll note, I think, we're not done yet, but uh, I've answered, I've been able to ask maybe 20% of the questions, and um, <laughs> thank you for all the questions. There is a student question that wants to know how to get into energy policy and renewable energy field. Does one of you that works, wanna give a 30 second answer to that? Um, advice for internships, ways to access the energy policy field, I think on the more clean energy side. Anybody want to answer that? Um, advice to students. So there, there's a vibrant alternative energy industry in Colorado. You can find the companies from online and then pitch yourself aggressively. A, a resume is not enough. Say why you're passionate about it, why you're going to be an asset to the company and go after it. You can get in that field. I know there's, there are schools. I've, I've spent some time in a school in, in, uh, in, in Kansas, but there are community colleges where you can you could learn. This isn't necessarily going into the policy, but more in terms of the, the practice. But you can learn, uh, learn the trade. You can become a, a green collar worker. You can work in an office that's 300 feet up in the sky called, called a wind turbine. And it's, it's, quite, a, it's quite a life. It's quite a, quite a good job. And um, growing. Somebody, um, okay, so we're gonna let everybody, we have three minutes left. We're going to give you each 30 seconds, but I want you to p pitch your Fisk Planetarium panel. So we'll start with you. Ah, okay. 
Thank you. So uh, if anybody's interested uh, this, this evening, starting at 6 o'clock, I guess weather permitting, uh, uh, the, there will be an event at, at Fisk Planetarium. Uh, I think it's, it's National Poetry Month, so as part of that, there's a celebration there this, this evening. But as part of that celebration, uh, my colleague and collaborator and I, so my, my colleague is, is Julia Spiker Kasdorf, uh, who's a Mennonite, a, a poet, and has written documentary poems about fracking. Uh, and so she, this work is based in, uh, around rural Pennsylvania as well. So she and I collaborated uh, to produce a book called, as I mentioned, Shale Play, Poems and Photographs from the Fracking Fields. And we'll be presenting that work in the, in the dome of the planetarium this evening, along with uh, Julia doing, doing some reading, and there's a few other people also doing some, some readings. At, at 6 o'clock, right? Yes, 6 p.m. Great. Um, 30, uh, Go ahead. Okay, I'll end with just a, a, a human impact of extreme weather. So 100 years ago, roughly on average, 500,000 people a year were killed from extreme weather events across the globe. That's declined by 95%. It's about 30,000 people killed per year now from extreme weather. We'd like to get that to zero, but the world population has tripled. The deaths from extreme weather have declined almost 95%. Another celebration of modern world. Ivan, take um, it home for us. Investor-owned utilities make money off of building stuff and getting a rate of return and charging you. Um, so that's where a lot of the tension is. That's their job, but then you have regulators um, who somebody is supposed to be the adult in the room to manage all of this. And the only way you really uh, get to impact that is to, to participate. Thank you all for being here, and um, don't forget to fill out evaluations.